I remember when I first decided I wanted to transition from the world of still photography and photojournalism into documentary video. I was so fixated on how I was going to shoot my first doc project, like what camera and lenses I'd use, the cool drone shots I had in mind, and the beautiful music I'd open with, that for a few weeks I was able to ignore the fact that I really didn't think about what story I was going to tell. Deciding that I wanted to make documentaries was the easy part, but what to make them about turned out to be much harder than I expected. I had to teach myself to be actively looking for stories stories, and then capture those ideas before they disappeared from my goldfish brain, which, no matter what you might think in the moment, will happen fast. Sometimes a bowl of inspiration will strike in the middle of the night, but more often than not, even after 10 years of doing this, I have to work to generate ideas. i found some places are better than others for finding ideas, and I've gradually found a system for capturing those ideas that works for me. And that's what today's video is all about. Ideas. Where they come from, how you make sense of them, and then at the end, I'm going to share one simple thing I do to put my my idea into idea refining mode where I do some of my best thinking. So let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back, and if you're new here, my name is Luke Forsyth, and on this channel I teach the skills I've learned over 10 years working as a documentary filmmaker and photographer. If you're into that kind of thing, make sure to hit that subscribe button, because there's going to be new videos coming every week. When I was starting out as a photojournalist, I spent two years traveling around Asia with a used camera trying to build my first portfolio of documentary pictures. In those days, I didn't have a very methodical approach to finding stories, I basically just wandered around taking street pictures until something caught my eye to focus on. And even though I got some really cool stories that way, it wasn't very efficient, meaning that sometimes I spent weeks or even months between one story and the next. That was fine when I was mostly worried about training my eye and learning how to interact and photograph strangers, but the further along I got in my career, I didn't necessarily have the time or budget to just walk around the streets of a foreign country for weeks on end hoping something would magically reveal itself. I had editors who wanted to know what stories they were signing off on before they gave me travel budgets, and if you're going to pitch people ahead of time, you need to know what it is you're going to be shooting. Then when I made the jump into documentary video, all this became even more important. Video requires so much more gear than stills that suddenly wandering around wasn't even an option because there was so much extra stuff to lug around. And unlike documentary photography, Video production is more of a team sport with multiple specialists like fixers, sound guys, directors, producers, and DPs. And even though you can work in smaller teams to stay more mobile, I'd argue that the best results come from working with other people. The team aspect is actually one of my favorite things about video over photography, but the drawback is that you need to pay them, not to mention the cost of food, transport, and accommodation for everyone. Show me the money. <laughs> but this isn't a video about budgets. The point I'm trying to make here is that the more seriously you take documentary production, the more you need to know what you're doing before you start. And all of that hinges on coming up with and developing ideas so that you can shoot with intention instead of just spraying and praying. So where do I find ideas? I'll tell you my favorite places in a second, but first you're going to need a system for actually recording them when you do find them, or else they tend to just float away. Have you ever had a great idea for something, not necessarily for a doc project, but just something you were sure was going to be the best idea you'd had in a while? Then the phone rings or an email comes in and before you realize what's happened, that idea gets bumped out of your short-term memory. No matter what I do in those situations, I probably won't get that idea back. And nowadays, if I accept that I don't record an idea really fast, it's most likely not going to stick. So before you start hunting for ideas out there, the first thing you're going to want to do is set up some sort of fast capture system. There's no right way to do this and you can use anything from your phone to a paper notebook, but the emphasis here has to be on fast. You want to find a system that has as little friction as possible meaning it's as easy as it can be to get that idea down. Because if it's annoying, you might think twice about doing it, and then the idea will be gone forever. It's nice in theory to have a leather-bound notebook with beautiful handmade paper, but if it's too big to fit in your pocket, you won't have it when you really need it. I personally just use Apple Notes because I always have my phone and there's even a shortcut button I can get to from the lock screen. So the time from thought to typing is about two seconds. Little moleskin notebooks are also great if you like physical rather than digital, but there's always the risk that it's gonna get wrecked in a rainstorm or, or something like that. Whatever you go with, just keep it handy and get the idea down fast. Later, maybe once a week or something, you can go through these notes and cross out all the garbage. But somewhere in there, there might be the start of a really good project. I'll tell you later a trick I use when trying to develop these ideas into something bigger, but for now, all that matters is capturing them. All right, so you're ready with your fast capture system, but where do the actual ideas come from? For me, they come from a few different places, but probably the most common is from consuming other people's stories. 
That can be movies or books or TV shows or magazines. Anywhere somewhere is telling a good story of their own can be a great source of inspiration. The point here isn't to copy a story that's already been told, but to find your own takes and stories within them. My photography mentor once told me it's impossible to copy a story because no matter what, you're gonna bring your own style and life experiences to it. And in the end, it's gonna be different. Like no matter how hard I tried, I wouldn't be able to remake Grizzly Man because one, I don't have Werner Herzog's perspective on the world and two, I don't have his amazing German accent. It's like death staring at you when you look at it. Among many other reasons. But even though I could never copy it, I could watch Grizzly Man and get inspired to make my own story about grizzly bears in a way that makes sense to me and my situation, like how they're dealing with climate change in Canada or something like that. The point is that no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't copy Herzog's movie, but it could be a jumping off point for a story of my own. So while you're watching and that idea pops into your head, grab your phone or your notebook or whatever fast capture system you're gonna use and get it down as quickly as possible. Movies and other documentaries can be great places to find ideas, but personally, I prefer reading. Fiction, nonfiction, books, magazines, it doesn't matter. Reading is the oldest way that we have of absorbing storytelling, and I personally think that things you read resonate with you in a way that other types of media don't. I've gotten more ideas for stories from reading than I think any other place, and that's one of the main reasons why I like to try and read for at least half an hour every morning before I do anything else. If you're more into magazines than books, my personal favorites are National Geographic and The New Yorker. I probably don't need to explain National Geographic too much, but it's been telling incredible multimedia stories for way longer than any of us have been alive. Any single issue of the magazine probably has 10 different things in it that would make for great documentary subjects, and most of the time, the writers have already gone through the hard work of doing all the research for you. And I'm not saying to go out there and just recreate the same story in video instead of text and photos, but look for ways to make it your own. Was the lead water scientist in paragraph four well-spoken and interesting? Maybe she'd be a great character. Or maybe while you're reading a story about African wildlife, you read a quick description of one of the antique poaching units and wonder what it would be like to work in one of those units. Go through an issue and keep your quick capture ready because if you can't find at least 10 ideas, you're probably not reading closely enough. The New Yorker is the gold standard when it comes to long form nonfiction storytelling. Their articles can be more like small books rather than newspaper columns and their writers are some of the best in the world. On top of that, they let their writers look into anything that sounds interesting, not just current events or things that are big in the news. One of my favorite writers in the world, John McPhee, is a New Yorker staff writer and he's written an entire book on a single tennis match and another just called Oranges that's just about you guessed it, oranges. And it's fascinating. New Yorker writers are masters at finding interesting stories around the world, and any one of them might give you five more ideas for stories of your own. A few years ago, I filmed a feature doc for Showtime about a baseball team on the US-Mexico border, and that entire film came about because of a single paragraph in a New Yorker story that wasn't even about baseball. Plus, you'll look smart reading it on the bus, so there's that too. When it comes to books, there's pretty much unlimited choices and you should just follow your interests and find writers you like. You don't need to read only classic literature and you definitely don't need to stick to nonfiction exclusively to find great story ideas in books. A few months ago, I read The Remains of the Day, which is a fiction book about a butler in an old school British manor house. And it got me thinking about what an interesting documentary you could make about 21st century butlers and how they see their role in the modern world. I'm probably not gonna make that one, but if you're watching this from England and need an idea, Find a good character, and i definitely watch that. But a lot of the time, some of my best ideas don't come from external sources, but from my own life. It might sound silly to say that your own life can give you ideas that are just as interesting as some big international issue or a war on the other side of the world, but it's true. Not all stories need to be big anyways. And if you've ever seen The King of Kong, one of my favorite all-time docs, you'll know this is true. It's just a couple of guys trying to set the world record for Donkey Kong, and it's amazing. It's also hilarious, emotional, and so so, so good, but it's a great reminder that not all stories have to be huge and epic to be worth telling. And if you need more convincing, it won the Oscar for best documentary. Now you might not personally know the reigning Donkey Kong world champion, but chances are you have access to people and places that other people don't, and that in there somewhere is a great story. Do you work part-time at McDonald's? I have no idea what that's like and would actually be pretty curious. Are you an avid ice climber or a backcountry skier? Leverage that passion to get in touch with the local legend who's now 80 but still gets out every day. I'm in the middle of a four month shoot right now that all came up because my summer job in university. I can't say too much about it right now as we're still actively pitching, but when I was working there, I never imagined that I'd be back with a documentary film crew. Access is always gonna be one of the most important elements in making a documentary. And especially when you're starting out, working on stories about things you know will make that 
it's so much easier. I'll give you another example. I grew up in a town of less than 30,000 people and you'd never think that would be the sort of place to tell exciting stories. But when the Syrian civil war started getting really bad, the government of Canada made it legal for groups of private citizens to raise money and bring refugees over. They had to get together enough money to support the family for a full year while they studied English and looked for a job. So groups of people all pitched in together to share the cost. My mom ended up being part of one of those groups and through her, I met one of these Syrian families when they first arrived. It was incredible to see a family from Damascus try and make sense of my boring hometown in the middle of Canadian pig farming country. But for them, it was like Mars. We went to farmer's markets together and had dinner at their house and my mom gave them rides to the local high school for language lessons. I was living in Mexico at the time and working like crazy, so it was never something I was trying to take on as a project for myself, but I've always thought that for someone, it could have been a really incredible documentary. And if that's happening in tiny towns in Southern Ontario, then there is interesting stuff happening wherever you live too. So look around at your own life and unique experiences because chances are there's something there. Okay, so you've got your capture system in place and you're constantly on the lookout for ideas. You're starting to fill up a couple pages, but the more ideas you add, the less sure you are about which ones are worth exploring. So how do you sift through the noise and actually figure out what to focus on? Basically, you just need to think about it but not the kind of thinking you do when you're absently scrolling through Instagram, like real world focused thinking, where you remove distractions and try and grind on something specific until you find some clarity. Personally, I've never been able to do my best thinking when I'm surrounded by the distractions of the internet. So when I have an idea and I really need to figure out if there's something to it or not, I go for a walk. I know it might sound a little dumb, but hear me out on this. Firstly, walking gives your body something to do that you don't have to pay much attention to, and your brain can do it automatically in the background, kind of like when you start daydreaming in the middle of a long drive. Secondly, it gets you away from your computer and it keeps your phone in your pocket, unless you wanna be one of those people running into walls or tripping over curbs. You don't have to put any pressure on yourself, but I found that if I just have an idea or a few ideas in mind, and then I go for an hour long walk and let my mind churn over the possibilities, more often than not, I come up with something. If I really want to think about an idea, I'll leave my headphones off too, and I found that really keeps me grounded and on topic. Whatever works for you. Walking for an hour gives you uninterrupted time to think, where all you have to do is look back on all those ideas you collected in your quick capture system and figure out which ones have potential. That note you made about minor league ice hockey dreams? Is there a story there or just a topic? Do you have a character? If you called your uncle who works for one of the league sponsors, could he possibly set up a meeting? Or what about your idea for a film about the opioid crisis? How far would you have to drive to find characters? Would they even talk to you? Is there something closer to home that would touch on the same issues? Don't you know someone from college who worked as a social worker downtown? I found that just by giving my mind some basic guidance about what it needs to think about and then letting it do its thing while my body is just worried about putting one foot in front of the other has generated so many ideas for me over the years that I try and do it every single day. Maybe those 10,000 step trackers on your phone can be about more than just weight loss because if you do 10,000 steps a day but with the aim of thinking about documentary film ideas, my guess is you're gonna start coming up with them left and right. That's what works for me, but I'd love to hear what works for you. So if you have any go-to methods for thinking clearly, let me know in the comments. Generating ideas for documentaries isn't something you can just sit down and do, like putting numbers into a spreadsheet. But if you surround yourself with good storytelling in the form of movies, books, and set up a system to record those ideas as they pop up, and then give yourself the space to think about those ideas on a long walk, I think you'll find that pretty quickly you'll have something worth working on. Hope you liked that video and think about giving it a like or subscribe if you did. It really helps the channel and it lets me know what kinds of videos you want to see more of. And if you've got some ideas of your own from this and want to see more like it, maybe check out this other video I made about how ancient philosophy can make you a better filmmaker. See ya!